Because of the gigantic migration routes, Wyoming has the biggest, most genetic diverse mule deer herd in the country. up in that high country during the summer, but you can't stay there during the winter, so you need to move down to the basins. And that's what you do if you're a mule deer in Wyoming. You know, when we look at these migrations, we're looking at generations of cultural knowledge. We make these maps, but if you lose the migration, and even if you know where the map is, you can't recreate it because it, it exists in their experience. As landscapes get developed, subdivisions go in, changes are happening to this landscape, a big question is how much can these animals tolerate? What's the winter range? Winter range is anywhere a deer decides to try to winter in. Spent all my life out here. But I started way young. My father gave me a camera when I was 14 and told me to go out and take stills of wildlife. Where I grew up, I could sit there and watch deer and elk and spend all my time doing that. And that's the trouble. Most people just go out and observe the wildlife during the hunting season. I think you need to do it year round to understand the animals and, and what kind of behavior they'll have in different situations. I don't just take pictures of just an animal standing there or animal grazing. I look for, when you look at the picture, it tells a story other than just the animals standing there looking at you. Now those elk went over the top, so it's time to move out. They got tired of me talking. If you ever watch a mule deer, he'll eat, and then he stops eating, and you watch his ears move. I don't think, I think his ears are so sensitive that when he eats, he can't hear because he drowns it out from grinding his teeth. But anyway, first time I went on the winter range, I was 14 years old, and I'm 71 now, so you have to get a calculator. Now. <laughs> I was with my dad, and we're, we were hunting down in Pine Dale and Big Piney in Cora on basically the winter range. And that was the first time I, I saw mule deer on the winter range, and there was literally thousands and thousands of deer. Not hundreds, but thousands.
Is that Goliath? Yep, that's Goliath right there. So I got to handle him and LaBarge. Jeez. 2000, that was. And he'd gone way downhill. I yeah, think at yeah, his exactly. peak, he was 210 typical. Yeah, yeah, so and that's I think there he's like 194. So yeah, his, his uh, un like undoubtedly his teeth start wearing down, yeah. you know, and it's just it's kind of what old. happens. Boy, look at that deer. Yeah, that's a nice deer too. Boy, that's a heck of a deer. Yeah. Wow. What's the best year you think you've ever seen in there oh, man. for deer? Bucks, best big year? bucks. 2014 was a good year. I'll show was you it? 2014, but I don't know. We had a, a good spate of pretty good antler growth in the early 2000s. Yeah, that's where the, a lot of these, this is early yeah. 2000, so. That's what dreams are made of right there, yeah, isn't right it? There. Wow. 2004? Yeah, yep, roughly. 2004, yeah. We're here with a special guest today in Afton, Wyoming, Gary Fralick, who is the biologist for the Wyoming Range region here in Wyoming, and he is in charge of the Wyoming Range mule deer herd, probably one of the biggest and most prestigious deer herds in the United States, in my opinion. And we're going to talk to him about some of the projects they're doing here on migration and mule deer in general. And tell them a little bit about yourself, Gary. How did you end up here? For 30 years, it's been a long, a long road. I've been with the outfit uh, now uh, for 34 years, and uh, 27 years that I've been uh, as a biologist in the Star Valley in the Big Piney area. Uh, the Wyoming Range herd uh, has been has been a, a special uh, sort of management opportunity. Wyoming range and other deer herds in Wyoming that historically have a reputation for producing uh, trophy class bucks whether you want to hunt them or photograph them or just like to watch them. We have a good grasp of, of how important mule deer uh, populations are to the state of Wyoming especially the Wyoming range herd and so what we've tried to do develop these research projects and that research project that we're uh, cooperating with and collaborating with Dr. Monteith at the University of Wyoming has led to these data sets that we're going to come to understand how this population grows and recedes. And we've already learned a uh, substantial amount of information. And it seems like to me, Gary, it's like the, the mule deer seem to be like the canary in the coal mines, so to speak, in that they're kind of the species that if they're healthy and you do things for the mule deer, that help that population, it cascades down to other things. What's good for the mule deer is also good for the antelope, can be good for the elk. And you're literally now setting benchmarks that have never been set before because you didn't have the data to do that. The floodgates now has, have been open. The only way to get that information is to work for many years, potentially being able to cut across multiple generations of animals, right? And we often design studies in two to three year swaths of periods. We do something for two, three years, we move on somewhere else. The fact is there's no way you can cross generations of animals and put their stories together unless you're working for out to a decade plus. You know, we've been working for seven years and even where we've gotten so far, the information we've garnered from that has been pretty phenomenal and unlike anything we've ever seen before. But at the same time, we're just getting into the really exciting stuff that we haven't been able to put our fingers on. The deer will take about three hours with prep work and then mounting. We're here in Laramie, Wyoming, just outside the University of Wyoming. We're going to be talking to Dr. Kevin Monteith, who is in charge of the Wyoming Range Mule Deer Project. 
So Kevin, can you give us just a little bit of a background of how you ended up here in a taxidermy studio with a doctorate degree? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually just a small town kid from Northeastern South Dakota. The way we fed our family, made a living was through hunting and fishing. So I grew up hunting and fishing, love and passion for the outdoors and hated school, which is the funny part of why I now have a doctorate degree. I happened to find out that there was a wildlife school in South Dakota, because that's the other nuance of me. There's no way I was gonna leave South Dakota. As time went by, I realized there's way more to this field than being a game warden, because that's what I thought I was going to school for. I didn't know there was anything else out there. And I learned that you could learn about what makes these animals tick. The taxidermy side of things, I think just draws from, again, my desire to be connected to wildlife, the Wyoming Range Mule Deer Project came about when I met Gary Fralick here in Wyoming. Just happened to start talking mule deer, as often happens. And of course, Gary's been managing the, mule deer, the Wyoming Range Mule Deer population for a long time. I expressed some of his concern with it, the public interest in research and learning new information, and we thought, hey, why don't we get something going here? This, this is something that we should do. It's culminated in initiating the Wyoming Range Mule Deer Project back in March of 2013. I don't think anybody would have thought that we would still be working today. That has been going on for a while now, yes. right? Almost yep. a decade. The migration piece is recent. I mean, that's just been sort of an ongoing development as awareness of how far in the places that these animals are going to. So it's something that we just haven't had the perhaps the full appreciation of until we started radio marking animals, putting GPS collars on them. some video of a, what we call the cheater buck, great big buck I filmed on the winter range one time and he had one eye punched out. And he was in a, in a little ravine eating and it was snowing and his bad eye was towards me and he had his head down and he didn't even know I was there and I whistled, finally pulled his head up and turned, his, turned so he could see me with the other eye and looked at me and then turned and bounced off. It's a pretty classic piece of footage that everybody likes because yeah off one side I had a great big long cheater that was that it would that also branched off and he was, he's pretty heavy classic old buck this old buck probably punched an eye out on the winter range during the rut I wrote in my book hunting high country mule deer that was published in 1996 uh, chapter 19 in it there's a little chapter explaining all these migrational routes and particularly for mule deer, and that of all the housing and development, some of them were being blocked off, and if they didn't pay attention, they were gonna block most of them off, and the mule deer population was gonna suffer, so. So you knew way back in 1996 it was a problem. Well, I knew even back further than that, you know, but that, that was the first time I wrote it in anything, you know. Matt Kaufman, we, got, we had the opportunity to sit down with Matt, who is one of the leads on the Wyoming Migration Initiative. What's your takeaway from that conversation? What they're doing is is really great. So these deer there's a, aren't... There's a buck. There's a buck right there. Let's talk about the Migration Initiative. What started it? Our group at the University of Wyoming, we're all wildlife biologists, we're researchers. We're doing all this migration research. And meanwhile, these migrations are getting a little more difficult every year. We've had this thought that we could do more to help educate the public and make it more useful to wildlife managers. And there's additional herds that we know are migratory that have never been mapped, not in detail with the GPS collars. Yeah, what, you've known about these migrations for a really, really long time. Let's talk about some of the stuff that you've seen. Back when I was growing up, you were able to hunt in the corridors in November, and the season ran until the end of December on the winter ranges, if you can believe that. I learned how they, because you gotta leave tracks. There's a lot of their tracks. And you can see where they were going 
And it was very interesting too, because you could go along and suddenly you'd run out of track. So you know, the migrational herd, would, sometimes they'd stop in areas. They wouldn't just all just suddenly be down there. They, it was a gradual thing. I know they, they would stay maybe a week or 10 days before they kept moving down further. That was part of knowing how to hunt the deer. So I learned that. When with the Columbus Shadrae that we see what you're just describing, you know, the mule deer don't just, it's not like you get one snow and the mule deer just pour out of the mountains down to the winter range. They like play the winter. So they, you know, they, they, they move out of the, their, where they're summering to, the, to a first area, you know, get down a little bit where it's less likely to get caught in a deep snowstorm, but there's still a lot of food and that they might take two months, you know, working their way down. When you're a mule deer going down to winter range, it's like every step towards winter range is a step towards poor food that you're gonna have to share with everybody else that's all, that's down there. They, they try to stay up in the high country as long as they can. So we talk a lot about surfing the green wave and these other things that are associated with the timing of which animals move across the landscape and they're tracking that really lush food. But the really critical part that's allowing them to be have this robust population is that all these animals are making use of all this different food that exists across the landscape. So by moving, they're functionally increasing the resources that are available to them. If they don't move, they're stuck with the resources that are right there. So it's a pretty amazing behavior that has huge population level consequences. GPS technology has not only advanced our understanding, but it's certainly advanced our appreciation for these big landscapes. Pretty amazing to think of an animal that lives in one place for a number of months and then may go over a hundred miles to another place, to a brand new home, live there for a number of months, do very different things during that window of time, like females are producing, rearing offspring, that sort of thing, and then taking them back down to winter range. Those bucks are growing, they're putting on body fat, they're growing antlers, that sort of thing, and then progressively returning back to winter range. And so what we've come to appreciate is that their life and their world isn't just in this spot where we see them one day, right? Another critical part of their life could be 100 miles away. Right, and, and when we flew over to see Gary, we, you know, there's a famous buck named Popeye that my dad and, and a lot of other people filmed. When we flew over Popeye's winter range, this is August, it's, you know, you know what it looks like out there. It's dry, yeah. pretty desolate looking. I mean, in, to the normal eye, you think there's nothing out here, right? Yep. And it comes to life in the winter when all those deer show up. But then we fly to Popeye's summer range, it's at 10,500 feet, but it's as lush as you would ever see want to see how did those bucks figure out how to go from that summer range to that winter range and it obviously didn't happen overnight mm -hmm. but it could be shut off overnight you can see all these roads though i mean how that affected the deer when they put on in all these i mean all those like those look like lakes but they're actually cooling ponds for oil wells and stuff I and mean, that's that's detrimental. When we were kids, none of these roads are in here. It'd take you all day to get up there. Oh yeah, they crisscross this whole country with road after road after road. Yeah, when we were kids in the 70s, you could literally just go on the edges of this. I mean, if you wanted to get in this, you had to hike, and there's no way you could get out there in the winter. Oh. And we're gonna now fly on up the range into where their summer range is. And we actually talked to Mark McCord on the phone the other day, who was the hunter, the guy who took this photo, a Popeye, and uh, on his summer range. Mark's the only person that we actually know and obviously documented uh, where Popeye lived his, his uh, summers and he told us exactly where he took this photo. So we're gonna fly from the winter range up to Popeye's summer range and try to match up this photo to the exact spot of, uh, of where Popeye summered. A lot of folklore about Popeye and a lot of people think they saw Popeye, you know, in the high country, but you're the only one that actually documented the buck alive in his summer range we're gonna go and, and try to trace Popeye's migration route 
but we need to get from you the golden key to the whole thing. Where in the heck did you take that photo? <laughs> I started hunting when I was in my uh, 30s. I was in the Air Force and, and started hunting. Loved the high country and uh, read some of y'all's material and stuff. And you guys gave me a blueprint of how to go out and, and hunt these mule deer bucks and stuff. So uh, I was fortunate to draw a tag in Wyoming. I, I thought, well, I better get out there in the summertime and figure out where I might want to hunt. We got out some maps and said, well, where do we want to go to look? And we said, well, let's, let's get up in the high country and get away from some trails and stuff and just go take our binoculars and start glassing. Put the X on the map and, and hiked up in there. Spent the night at some lakes and caught some fish. One evening, second or third night there, I hiked up on a ridge, looked over the next ridge, and there was two really big bucks over there. <laughs> And Popeye was one of them. There's another very large buck with them. Getting dark, so next morning I hiked up there. He was still in that same basin. Hiked down and was able to get pretty close to him and took a whole roll. At the time, we are on 35 millimeter, you know. We didn't have the digital. And I, I was able to get a whole roll of him, and he never really spooked. He, I think he eventually came where I was there, and he just kind of moved slowly off, uh, moved up to the north. And, uh, yeah, it was a great experience. There's another really nice buck with him as well. I went back September was bow season. I went back September 10th. I couldn't get there the first when bow season started. I saw some other bucks up there, but I did not see him. But what I did see was up in that basin where I was, there was a lot of fresh footprints. And so I don't know if somebody else had seen him and kind of taken horses up in there or what, but uh, I spent about a week up there looking for him and I, I was not able to find him at that time. We went up to the Crow Creek Lakes and we camp there, that's where we fish. Then there's a ridge line just north of the Crow Creek Lakes. And that's the ridge line I went up to and looked down into the next basin and is right down in that area where he was. All right, let's go up over, huh? Yep. Basically have on base map marked about a 350 yard radius circle where we think he was. You're headed right toward, I think. Mark said he climbed up from the lake over the ridge and looked off the back, which would be this right here. I mean, you can match it up. Yeah. The last strip where it turns to rocks. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's it. He got 25 yards from the buck. All river range. He was right at the top of it, wasn't he? Captain area traffic, Skyline 23 Charlie Alpha is eight miles to the west, or to the east, come in to the west. Yep. One thing that we've learned with mule deer especially, and this understanding has come along fairly recently, and it's definitely something that's different from mule deer than a lot of our other ungulates, is that they're incredibly faithful to their migratory route. Now, now it's largely thinking through the lens of females, because that's where we've done a lot of our work. They use that migratory route year in and year out. The odds of them changing and doing something different is very rare. But amazingly, we haven't had a firm appreciation for how that route was ever established in the first place. The reason we haven't had that information is because the only way to get it is to start from day one. Meaning you start from a newborn fawn, fawn you know where it's born, you know what mom does. You know what mom's migratory route is, and so that fawn stays with mom during that first migration sequence. What we really need to understand is what that fawn does its next year. Where does it go when it becomes independent from mom? And that's been that missing piece. So there's this idea called the rose petal hypothesis, which is something that's been developed with white-tailed deer out east. There's this notion that you have a matriarchal female, she has a daughter who then sets up shop next to her, and then that they continue to produce offspring and you continue to have these daughters that set up shop around them. So you'd end up with a cluster of related females on the landscape. When you consider migration, if that's something that happens, we don't want to lose any of those roses, right? It's those roses that potentially retain the memory associated with that place on the landscape. And, and hence the reason it's really critical for us to understand how those migratory patterns develop in the first place. That matters for a whole bunch of reasons. One reason is, is we're not just protecting or caring for space on the landscape, we're caring for memory on that landscape. Because as you could imagine, if we, for whatever reason, whether it's 
unintended harvest practices or something that happens obstructs the route on a landscape or whatever the case may be or a bad winter that happens to wipe out the whole group you create a vacant space on that landscape nobody has the memory to go there anymore and so there's no longer deer using that space and that's where that component is where it becomes critical for the wildlife management portion of it gary's side of it where he's deciding how we're gonna how when and how many we're gonna hunt and that absolutely. that part of it absolutely the old timers will always say that if you shot out a, a basin of bucks it would take generations for it to repopulate we're not quite sure we understand yet how these bucks populate these high elevation basins and one good example was last year we were in the Wyoming range uh, we were glassing five bucks in a basin one of them was radio collar it was a yearling buck and we kept glassing in the basin and over in the far side directly across from us was his mother so his mother the doe had given birth to him somewhere in that general vicinity did he meet up with these older age class bucks because that's where we generally was born are, are they related Good point. They could be, they could be brothers. Good point. Two they could or all, three year they old could all, They could all be related. So the doe you see on the way up the creek drainage could be the mother of the buck you kill at the top end in the basin. In this example, it, it doesn't get any better than that. And we'll clear yeah. a cut. Now you know exactly what those deer are doing and this rose petal idea is really neat. Is it conceivable to say that this will be the turning point for mule deer? Well, I'm not sure about the turning point. I think what we're learning has assisted us as deer managers in managing this deer population because now when you as a hunter come to us and ask us well you know what age classes grow these type of antlers and how can we better manage for them or understand the complexity of, of antler growth then we can not only talk about uh, habitat conditions but the research information that has come from the Wyoming range work and the nutritional condition of doe deer. We know doe deer uh, really ultimately have a major influence in probably the sole influence on, on how big her, her sons get both body wise and as far as the antler growth. Two little bucks standing right in the rocks, skyline. They look pretty healthy this year. We haven't had any below zero weather. It's really pretty nice, you know. We haven't done much work on males, but we do see it doesn't take as much snow to push the does out of the high country. The bucks will stay up there longer. Back in those days when we could hunt, during November and December, as soon as it got 15 below or colder, it seemed like suddenly they all started showing up on the winter range. It mm -hmm. was like they flipped a switch. Then they, of course, have to eat several times a day. And, and when it got 25 below, everybody showed up for the party. I do know some of those bucks stay, uh, come out early because Popeye, he's very noticeable. And a, and a buddy of mine saw him the last year of his life within 15 miles of the winter range, 12th of November. That picture is taken on the western side of the Salt River Range. He had to go over that mountain range, down the other side, cross the Grays River, up over the Wyoming Range, and back down Wintered around the Big Piney or something? Yeah, like yeah, wintered down there by La Barge. Now, there was a lot of guys hunting Popeye that year in the high country, but nobody took him. Suddenly, in November on the winter range, here he shows up with that 41-inch outside spread. You know, nobody ever took Popeye. We had a bad April storm come in, and Popeye was 11 years old and just didn't make it. So we got documented those three deer and uh, on that one particular winter range, which is a pretty big winter range. So I call them the Wyoming living legends because other than uh, Goliath, the rest of them were never, never harvested but were found on public land. So it's kind of interesting and that spawned a whole bunch of videos on winter range deer and that sort of thing. And it's surprising to me that there's still people still think of those bucks and know about them. 
Yeah, we got our first snowstorm, big one. I know they're coming out. They've kind of hung up in areas that they normally don't winter in this time of year, which is good because that vegetation is never hit during the winter time. And now we had this big storm come through and dropped foot, foot and a half of snow right here in the valley floor. Maybe find something I can film take photos of. It is 13 degrees and looks like about a 15 mile an hour wind. So you figure out the wind chill. But every little migrational route has its own quirks and different things that deer, elk, and antelope do. This one up here, I've lived up here for 16 years and next to the wilderness up here, Absorky Beartooth Wilderness. And and those deer will migrate out of that country. It's about a 50 mile migration and it's public land and intermingled with private. And as soon as the snow melts a bit, they will come and move back up in here. So they're constantly going back and forth here as the snow piles up and then melts in here. That's what we call windswept slopes. You go off that and there might be a drifts that are six foot deep there, but right along those ridges is, is bare and those animals can uh, get to the vegetation. All winter ranges are not created equal. It's what really is, is resonating now with deer managers in western Wyoming, you know. And it's because of weather patterns, you know, and the structure of the winter range, the plants that grow there, and the summer range, and what condition the deer show up on the winter ranges after coming off the high elevation summer range. We're going to have multiple data sets that we're going to come to understand how this population grows and recedes. And we've already learned several a uh, substantial amount of information on that based on the 2016 to 2017 winter. They were in such poor condition, one of the poorest conditions uh, that we were able to document in, in March of 2017 ever. That poor nutrition was translated into fetal development. And uh, as a result, we saw many of the fawns that were born in June of 17 either still born or die shortly thereafter. And it's all based on the condition of that doe. Our data indicates that that was the most substantial winter mortality event on the Wyoming range herd in at least 34 years. It's not just the winter, it's the stresses of the winter that cause a problem. We can't affect the weather, but we can affect the stress level that they're getting from human interaction, which is highways, mm -hmm. which is developments, which is gas and oil developments and, and how we handle those. I'm not saying we don't do them because they're very important to our state. They're very important to, our, to the human race, but just do them the right way. You go anywhere across the West, born and raised in hunting, and we've watched these mountain valleys be developed. A lot of it's been turned into five acre ranchettes. Every ranchette has a road, they have dogs, they have fences, all the things that come with human encroachment on the winter range. So winter range is a really important part of this. The migration corridors is another very important component of this. Obviously that came to be because all the work that's been done in Wyoming through the, the Wyoming Migration Initiative, they've really charted the way. We're here with Casey Stimler, who is a part of the Department of Interior. You're the migration coordinator. What does that entail and how, how are you involved in the mule deer, mule deer migration? So about two years ago, the Secretary of Interior signed a secretarial order that um, specifically said that it was the Department of Interior's goal to help improve the winter range and migration corridors for deer, elk, and pronghorn, and the deer specifically are mule deer, in 11 western states. The Bureau of Land Management, they manage over 245 million acres. They're the largest land manager in the nation, and most of that acreage is in the west. So we have a responsibility to make sure that the land we're managing benefits wildlife, recreation, other types of uses. So the secretary recognized that we have a role to play, but we also recognize that big game species are so economically and ecologically important to the West, that this was an opportunity to do something that would benefit sportsmen as well. Hit him again, he's still up. He's going behind the, he's, he's right just to the left to the, of the green the bush. bush. Hit him again. 
Over him. You were high. Nope, you dumped him. He's dead. Woohoo! Good job. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good, good deer, man. <laughs> <laughs> Moving wow. forward, we approached these 11 states and said, okay, look, do you have the data? Do you know where these migration corridors or winter range areas are? If you don't, we're gonna provide funding for you to do the research to collect that information so that you can then scientifically know where these migration corridors are, the winter range areas. Once a state has done that, we then provided funding to do the habitat work within those priority areas. And I specifically requested only three to five priority areas from the states. The reason I did that is because what happens when we do conservation, we dilute ourselves. And we wanna do a little conservation here, a little conservation there, a little, and you look at it and you go, wow, what did we cumulatively accomplish here? But when you focus using science, on a very specific area, you have an opportunity to actually make a difference. The research priorities, the habitat projects, are not from the federal government. These are from the state fish and wildlife agencies. We, the Department of Interior, have provided funding. For example, from the research end, we provided $6.4 million over the last two years to fund 41 research projects. And then on the habitat side of it, we've provided over $10 million for on-the-ground habitat projects, and those have been matched by $30 million. And so we've wow. done a lot of, lot of habitat work as well. That's amazing. Those numbers are amazing. Climbing Range Mule Deer Project would be one of those 40? Yes. So of the 41 projects across 11 states, mule deer was two times the number of other species. One of the developments with the migration corridors that's been really positive for conservation is our ability to map the corridors. And when we map the corridors, especially with mule deer, we often find that they're really fairly narrow. You know, you can sort of put that map on top of the landscape and see where fences need to be modified and where there are big ranches that should not be subdivided, right, and kept intact and where there are road crossings. And then when it comes to energy development, that creates the opportunity if you know where the corridor is to site your wells away from the corridor, leave the corridor open for those animals to move across it and, and still get the, the gas down below. One day I was coming out of here and I come around the corner and here's a little four point buck. He was wrapped up in the top fence strand and he'd been laying there all night. He was still alive and so I got out and got a pair of clippers and. Um, started working on it. I, I cut I actually cut that fence and got him and he got up and and uh, was able you know save his life and as the season the winter gets a little later on they start getting a little weak and when they jump the fence sometimes they their back leg goes under and if it if it's wire it'll go under and wrap around them and there they lay if it's a post like this they hit it and they just hit it and it their leg pops up and over it. We had a bad winter years ago and a lot of deer died off and at the time my brother and uh, dad were doing videos and one day I told him I said you know you guys ought to go down there and video these bucks they've all come back and my brother went down and, and he found this one buck and he called him Morty. He filmed Morty three years that uh, he'd come on the winter range he was never killed and these are bucks that are found on public land and are hunted. Finally, uh, one year he was coming out and a buddy of mine down there in Pinedale found, his, found him in the bar ditch where somebody had hit him as he was going through the corridor and crossing the road there, high main, major highway, and got hit and, and that was the end of him. Hundreds of deer dying every year. As you can imagine, if you're a deer wintering along uh, Highway 189, just that daily movement between foraging and loafing areas, you're exposed to highway traffic. These highway projects, fencing uh, highways that are in migratory routes, or even on, on winter ranges like the large winter range, now with uh, the projects that we've been able to accomplish over the last 30 plus years allow those deer, sometimes antelope, a few elk and probably some moose as well, to negotiate that highway without uh, the jeopardy of that they're going to be impacted by a vehicle. 
the solutions are clear and doable. And we've already seen them be implemented, right? So on the Red Desert to Hoback, when that was first mapped, top threat was this quarter mile section where the animals come to the town of Pinedale and squeeze between Pinedale, which is of course growing, and Fremont Lake. And they move through a quarter mile section and right <coughs> at that outlet of the lake, there was a 360 acre private parcel, which was which we discovered was up for sale. You know, they'd already sort of sketched in all the lakeside cottages that were going to be put <laughs> along the lake, <laughs> right? Go. And, and yeah. if that had been sold and developed, it would have literally like plugged up the corridor right right there, where at that point, four to 5,000 mule deer moved through it, you know, twice a year. Wow. But because we had the map and we knew that that was the point, the conservation fund raised $2 million to purchase that parcel and gave it over to the state. Wyoming Game and Fish accepted that and turned it into the Luke Lynch Wildlife Habitat Management Area expressly to keep that migration open. So, so for the first time in a hundred years, mule deer are showing up to the winter range and seeing an easier path than a harder path to where they're headed. People often want to point to one thing and at least in my business, I've been doing this for 28 years in wildlife management, rarely is it one thing that causes the problem. It's the cumulative effect of all those little things add up and eventually that habitat that's remaining may not be able to support what we would consider robust herds. So the order that I coordinate, that is really at the heart of this, is trying to look at some of these remaining habitats and say, okay, what's the issue? Can we get a project going? We're funding a lot of fence projects. Some fences aren't even used anymore. And so if the landowner voluntarily says, yeah, come out and remove the fence, we're fine with that. Or you want to put wildlife friendly fence in here? As long as it doesn't cost me anything, have at it. And that's what we do. We we're, we're not dictating to anyone. We're not, this is not regulatory. It's completely voluntary. And we had over 40 private land projects last year doing these types of things. And we did projects on federal land as well. As a Wyoming resident, this is a huge step for the government being big brother and actually giving us a hand and letting us do the work, but helping us where we need the help to get things actually moving and, and seeing results. We're seeing results from this. To me, it all comes down to habitat. The research informs where you do the habitat work, where the most important areas are on the landscape based on the animals telling us that now. Incredible amounts of migrations all throughout the state. There is. Even some just real short, yep. but all very critical to the survival of all this wildlife. It's not just the long distance migrations that matter. It's every piece. If they're occupying all these diverse places and you have all these diverse strategies, what that means is as things change, most likely one of those strategies is still going to be favorable or at least more favorable than the other. So you might take hits over here, but you maintain it over here and then it balances back out again. And we want to maintain that diverseness within because they're going to be more resilient to change in the future. Well, some people might think, oh, well, you know, they're spending a lot of money on all these studies and, and whatnot. But in the long run, that's money well spent. We may spend $50,000 to learn which two ridges we need to improve the habitat on versus spend half a million dollars on just habitat improvement everywhere. That's where he's at. That team right there is a long ways away. Because Wyoming is unique in the sense that the funding for your department, Game and Fish, is done by the sportsmen. And it's neat to see that it's not the sportsmen that are affecting the population. But our harvesting has very little effect on the actual Absolutely. growth or shrink of that population. You have 27 bucks, 23 bucks collared, and two, only two of them got yeah, taken by hunters. Yeah. I think the whole idea of deer management, you know, has really, really come home in, in uh, since the research and, and the data we've been able to collect in that and how the Game and Fish Department is managing this population by you know, making sure that uh, we can close the deer season before the migration. We want to certainly protect those bucks, and uh, we want to make sure that we don't run the, the deer season into the elk hunt because there's an influx of elk hunters and more hunters on the ground. 
we really haven't been hunting does or the reproductive segment of the population for well over 20 years. I believe that these bucks, especially the trophy class bucks, are every bit as valuable when people can see them, observe them, photograph them, when they're on the winter range, is just as valuable as they are when people are hunting them uh, on the crest of the Wyoming range or the salt range. And so I think that's uh, really a key component of our deer management program in western Wyoming is that uh, to sustain these bucks in the population because that's what the public demand. And one way to guarantee that they're going to persist on the landscape is to ensure that uh, we don't expose them when they're most vulnerable. We're sitting here doom and gloom, deer down, what, what can we do to, to help the deer and whatnot, but to hear you say you've managed this deer herd for almost 30 years and you had the best five-year run of, of deer population and hunting from 2012 to 17? To 16, to just 16. before the winter, yeah. 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 And I think a lot of people, it's a misnomer, they think, well, back in the 60s, it was the best deer hunting and it's been downhill ever since, and that's not necessarily true. So there is hope for this deer herd, and the more you guys are learning, the more information you're getting, the more funding you're getting, the more you're able to learn, and the more you're able to do to help these deer, and they can bounce back quick. You get a couple good years in a row, like you had in 2012, where you had five good years in a row, and it went up above objective, and your buck to doe ratio was very high. These deer are capable of bouncing back fast. All of the work that you do, funded by the sportsmen. A lot of this migration initiative stuff has been funded by grants and conservation groups and federal and state monies. What if I was just Joe Blow, mule deer hunter, what can I do? You know, if the public, you know, can really come to understand uh, the complexities of deer management uh, based on the information that we've been able to collect, I think, uh, and become better informed, I think that is so essential to successful deer management, uh, certainly in Wyoming. And Getting information at that level and that detail is expensive. You start running these airplanes or helicopters and radio callers, it gets very expensive very quick. The squeaky wheel gets the grease has never been so true in conservation either. Our community just needs to start paying attention. We, we read the stuff and we, we growls about it, but we actually don't take action. And I know we're all out here just trying to make a living. This is our passion. And we have to take a minute and pause and say, look, I'll, I'll go, I'll go do that. Or I'll go visit with somebody and, and get involved. I'll write a letter, call a senator. It's that simple. Show up to a banquet. Exactly, support your local conservation group, whatever it might be. Hunting used to be, and it still is kind of, a family affair. In the appreciation of the animal that they hunt, they don't want to see those animals to where they're completely destroyed. Whether it's deer, it could be antelope, which I'm really fond of, and elk, which I'm really fond of. All their migrational routes, and to make it so that in generational down the line, our kids and grandkids and great grandkids are be able to have this, and not just to shoot the animal, but to look at them too, to to observe them and Enjoy watch them. them. Science is, is really guiding what we do, and this is a conservation issue that we should be able to win. Finally, it isn't just hearsay or me lecturing to people saying, yeah, well, I watched the old migration and those deer are down here on the winter range. I just kind of wish that it would have happened 25 years ago, but it happened now and it's, it's good. And we still have time.